I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2021. Cinco de Mayo, a day commemorating Mexico's victory at the Battle of Puebla, isn't widely celebrated in Mexico, but it's basically a national holiday here. For many Americans, it's an excuse to strap on a sombrero while destroying a fully loaded quesadilla after too many strawberry margarita shots at a senior burrito. I'm Mexicano and Chicano. My parents are from Mexico and Cinco de Mayo was the 5th of May in my house. We didn't do anything. When I went to college, it, it turned into Cinco de Drinco and kids would just have this madres and they'd wear hats and sombreros and mustaches and it, it drove me crazy. Is Cinco de Mayo Mexican Independence Day? False, there's no independence of Mexico on Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is when the Mexicans kick the French's nalgas. That's, that's it. Now, is Cinco de Mayo the biggest holiday in Mexico? No, 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 no. Cinco de Mayo is, is the smallest holiday in Mexico. Maybe the biggest holiday in LA, I don't know, but definitely not Mexico. Does everyone drink tequila on Cinco de Mayo? That might be true. <laughs> I, you know, I hope everybody drinks tequila every single day. I love tequila. Are sombreros and mustaches an appropriate attire for Cinco de Mayo? No, 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 no. Unless you're a charro, unless you're descended of, of Vicente Fernandez, you do not get to wear a sombrero. Cinco de Mayo has become a Mexican-themed marketing machine. And the way many Americans celebrate it has long been criticized as insensitive or racist or an example of cultural appropriation. But is it? And if it is, how offended should we get when people dress up as caricatures of a culture? Not every cultural transgression is so clear cut. So what does cultural appropriation actually mean? The most simplest definition is taking from someone else's culture without permission. And that can encompass a lot of things. Usually we're talking about taking intangibles, intellectual property, cultural expressions, traditional knowledge, cuisine, dance, dress, music, uh, language, uh, traditional medicine, all of those kinds of things can fall under the rubric of cultural appropriation. I think that we're at a point where the term is being used and celebrated because it hasn't been in, in the past. There hasn't been this way for marginalized communities to have their voice heard. And social media has made that possible, initially through call-out culture and subsequently through cancel culture. So because in the past, cultural appropriation has just gone unchecked. There is this pendulum swinging in the other direction uh, that, that is giving a lot more opportunity to call out cultural appropriation. I suspect we will land back in the middle somewhere with an understanding that it's a descriptive term, not necessarily the end of a conversation, but the beginning of one. The idea of cultural appropriation has always been rooted in a power imbalance, when a dominant ruling class takes from a less dominant one. It becomes especially problematic when the thing that's being appropriated has a particular cultural or historical significance. I feel that hair is a big topic because we've had to fight so many, you know, con bad con connotations around our hair, what it looks like. I feel like a Kim Kardashian, I have no problem with her rocking braids, cornrows, but what I do have a problem with is other people in the world obsessing over it making it seem as if she created this now this is cute because she wore it when our women our black women you know the women of color have been doing this for years been telling stories with our hair for years and it dates back to slavery time you know making roots and, and hiding rice in the hair and i don't feel it could be a problem if someone from a different culture embraces another culture's hairstyle as long as you give credit where credit is due i have full locks in right now or boohoo locks and and you know, locks dread, are known for dreadlocks, right? It comes from the Rasta culture in, in the Caribbean. So it's not my culture, but I like the style. I like the way it looks. And by no means am I going out into the world and making it really cool. And as if I created this, as if I made it hot. Social media has given us a window into how other people live their lives and a public place to tirelessly call out celebrities and big brands when they miss the memo on acknowledging the source of their inspiration. Like when Kim K wore this hairstyle and called them Bo Derrick braids. Pretty sure there were a few folks rocking this look a little bit before 1979. Let's go 
ahead and define cultural appropriation because it's one of those terms very much like woke and even racist that the internet uses so excessively and so erroneously that the true meaning of the term has damn near lost all significance. I don't feel there's any real way to completely gatekeep an entire culture. I feel it's a beautiful thing when we can share with each other and be inspired by each other. It crosses over from appreciation to appropriation when ownership is trying to be taken for a specific aspect of culture or when people try to profit off of it or monetize a culture that doesn't belong to them. I think the key word with cultural appropriation really is stealing and exploitation. So why steal when you can borrow with permission? Why steal when you can celebrate and understand and teach and learn? It's all about who is being given the credit, who is profiting off of it, and where is it being sourced? What's, what's the integrity behind the action? It starts with understanding what it actually is. Then we won't be placed in positions where people just throw it around arbitrarily. When someone like, say, a billion dollar company is blatantly stealing from a culture without due credit or compensation, that may warrant more than a singular social media clapback. In 2017, our favorite online marketplace, Etsy, was accused of selling thousands of fake or ripped off products resembling the work of indigenous artisans in Guatemala. To combat copyright infringement and give these Maya artisans a voice, Ethical Fashion Guatemala was created. El sueño fue apoyar a los artesanos que están alrededor del lago y pues no solamente ellos, sino que poder ayudar a cualquiera que fuera de toda Guatemala para pues, poder vender sus productos. On top of helping artisans protect their intellectual property, they're a model for selling indigenous-made clothes and accessories ethically and directly to the consumer, making sure the artisans reap the rewards. Pues siempre la idea es que el artesano ponga su precio y que el precio sea justo, que o sea, no regateamos ni, ni, les, ni les bajamos el costo a ellos. They're so transparent, you can even contact artisans directly. La idea siempre fue que ellos fueran contactados directamente por el consumidor final. In Guatemala, where almost 80% of indigenous people live in poverty compared to 47% of the non-indigenous population, fair and ethical trade is one way to improve the lives of indigenous artisans. Pues, viene a ayudar mucho, no solamente a, a ellos como personas, sino que se sienten valorados y cuando alguien se siente valorado, pues, continúa haciendo su buen trabajo. Son semanas de elaborar un producto que, que sí es único y artesanal, entonces tiene, tiene mucho valor. Y no solo que son muchas horas de trabajo, pero también es un conocimiento ancestral que han ido heredando de generación en generación. The fashion industry was founded on the principle of cultural collaboration. And frankly, limiting people's ability to draw inspiration would inhibit creativity. But there's got to be room for the industry to rethink its practices so all artists involved can somehow benefit. When I decided to get into fashion, I knew I wanted to do it from a meaningful, meaningful point of view. I wanted to do something social and culturally important. Then I went to Bolivia seeking for my roots and that's where I launched my first ethical and artisanal collection. I select a group, I work with them, I stay with them, and I make sure that whatever ideas I get from those communities, I make them in those communities. I think when you are able to leave some time with the artisans to develop your collection or your pieces with them, and it's where you are supporting them and you're acknowledging that they are the true masters of the work. This dress was done by Paola, and Paola actually took 50 days in the tag of our clothing, it says the name of the artisans and how many days it took her to make it. So I think appropriation, as I tell you, is grabbing an ancestral piece, technique, and take it to your brand, put your label, and sell it. I think that's appropriation. While celebrating them and supporting them is when you work with them, you give them credit, you show how they do it, you bring your new ideas into their crafts and you create something new with them. And then you can put your label, still pay them fair trade, and it's a collaboration. And I think that's the difference. Within Latin American cuisine, there's a history of colonialism. Italy got tomatoes from South America, Ireland's potatoes came from Peru, 
and Belgium's chocolate came from present-day Mexico. My refrigerator has been accused of appropriation so much, he's had to deactivate comments on TikTok. The idea of cultural appropriation in the culinary world can get a little messy. Is it about the food we eat, or who's cooking it, or who gets the credit? Adam Medrano, the San Antonio chef behind the documentary Truly Texas Mexican, weighs in to help make sense of it all. We start our film with the story of the urban restaurateurs, urban cooks in San Antonio in the late 1880s, who were very, very successful businesswomen. They are the originators of the San Antonio, Texas urban restaurant industry. The Chili Queens of San Antonio were in all the plazas in the center of the city. They were so good, the food was so delicious, that it transformed uh, the downtown city of San Antonio into a tourist destination. Why is it an untold story? Because they were run out of downtown. Because they were not looking like the types of people that San Antonio bureaucrats and politicians wanted in San Antonio. So in other words, you wanted Mexican food without the Mexicans. It's a sad story. By 1947, they were gone. They were replaced by what is now known as Tex-Mex. A visitor from Chicago sees them, sees how successful they are, and then because he has access to banking and he's white, he sets up an indoor restaurant and he calls it, and it's very successful, he calls it the original Mexican restaurant. Does this mean that Anglo people cannot cook my comida casera? No, it means they can cook it. However, ask yourself those two questions. And is what I'm doing in the marketplace, which has ripple effects that are economic, social, and political, am I erasing a voice, the true voice of this flavor? Can you have beauty without justice? So what does this actually look like? What's up, mi gente? My name is Sergio Palacios, but some of you may know me as the Taco Tourist. Today, we're in Austin, Texas, to explore a very difficult question. What is the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation as it relates to Mexican food, specifically tacos? What do you think Tex-Mex is, if you had to define it in maybe a couple of sentences? I think it's a melding of you know, cultures and cuisines a little bit. I'm a clear representation of a Tex-Mex. Because okay. I am Mexican, because my parents are first generation, they migrated here, and then I was born here. So I'm a Mexican-American and more Tex-Mex. It is essentially a branding of a culture, but it represents actual culture that exists of Mexican-Americanism. The nacho, for example, is a Tex-Mex dish and not a Mexican dish. What would you say are some of the challenges that you faced, uh, the person as you are, from your background, trying to sell tacos? Well, I think you definitely get the look sometime, you know, people kind of look at the menu and they look inside and they're like, why guys, I work it out of here, you know? And I'm, hey, I've been guilty of that before. I would like people to get over that, you know, because I think we're pretty good at cooking in there. We're seeing a resurgence of a bunch of young people like myself, all from the background of cooking and trying to save that culture by either being authentic or even being creative, but still knowing enough of the culture, representing it well enough and then showcasing it. So what does authenticity in food mean to you? For me, authenticity is like my enchiladas potosinas. If you go to Mexico, where we're from, that's what's there. What is the difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation? When people exploit cultures and don't understand what's going on there, that, that's cultural pro appropriation, you know? Appreciation is when you really take the time to understand if you do use something from a culture, like you find a way to um, show it homage. When you actually enjoy the culture, you belong to a community that influences the way cuisine, music, dance happens. You can yourself create. When it comes to representing or claiming affiliation of a culture, what carries more weight? Lived experience or racial identity? Or does it always have to be both? The lines between race and culture can get blurry. A lot of us second and third generation bicultural kids know the struggle. We might not always fit what other people think Latinxes are supposed to look or sound like. Like when my Mexican friend refers to me as Latina light. Sounds cute, but why do I feel attacked? Can someone be accused of appropriating their own culture? What made you want to explore the idea of appropriation within your own culture? 
this question sort of popped into my head and I was finally like, wait a second, I can't be the only one who has ever felt this way. Like around my own wedding, like how much uh, Indian jewelry should I wear? I felt that it might have been weird for me to do the traditional henna even though that is something like very available to me as a, a half Indian person. I was like, given that I am also white, would that somehow come off weird or appropriative? Or because I did not grow up in the most traditional Indian household, is this me using this as a fun costume? I started talking to a lot of other other mixed race, multicultural people about this and found that, yeah, it was a pretty common sentiment. I don't think it's necessarily possible to directly appropriate from your own culture. I think if it is your culture, you have the ability to connect to it and do that work to bridge those gaps rather than coming in and being like, because I have this heritage, I am automatically an expert. This conversation comes up repeatedly in the music world with Latinx artists often having their Latinidad called into question. From Selena Gomez to Becky G to La Reina de Tejano music herself. Selena Gomez and Becky G and people who aren't necessarily born in Latin America and they don't necessarily speak Spanish that well. Uh, people, especially in Latin America, often don't see them as a a representation of Latinidad, so that's very unfair. I do believe that those artists are trying to get in touch with that side of themselves and, and how they identify themselves uh, through language, through sound, uh, and it's unfair to me that they're called appropriators because they are tapping into a part of themselves and experiences that they go through growing up in Latino households and uh, surrounded by Latino culture. I don't believe that they're appropriating, they, they're just uh, part of a larger concept and they are valid, totally valid members of that concept. Nobody wants to have their culture plagiarized, exploited, or portrayed insensitively. And that's what a conversation on cultural appropriation should really come down to. We need to get beyond solely valuing selective aspects of someone's culture more than the humanity that created it. Like when a fraternity threw a Cinco de Drinco party and attendees who dressed as maids and construction workers, allegedly in brown face, chanted, build the wall. They would have gone with the white power theme, but Walmart was fresh out of tiki torches. So if you celebrate Cinco de Mayo, enjoy your delicious reposado, order some tacos, or wear a sombrero if you must. But if you don't give a f about the Mexican people who created them, I hear Taco Bell has some amazing deals on their late night menu. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.